Here we have two different loops that iterate over the exact same underlying data, process it in the exact same way, and have a similar runtime. What might be easy to miss here is the size of each iterator in memory. The first iterator is taking up 800,000 bytes, while the second iterator is only taking up a residual 200 bytes. In some cases, the first iterator might even cause you to run out of memory, as it scales up with the amount of data, while the size of the second is independent. Let's dive into an example here and see what's actually happening. Let's say we want to iterate over some data, where this data could essentially be anything, and in this case, we're just going to print it. We don't actually have any data defined yet, so let's go ahead and create it with the function called data that we're going to create now. I'm going to give an arbitrary example at first just to illustrate the concept. Let's create a list to hold the data, and then loop from 1 to n, where n can be a parameter. Inside the loop, let's go ahead and append a string that's going to be i characters long, and then return this list when we're done. All this function does is creates this pyramid-looking list of strings. Of course we could have used a list comprehension instead, but don't focus on that for now. If we then loop over this list with a size of 10, we can see our output. If we raise our input size to 100, we get what we might expect. If we raise it to 1000, we get the same thing. If we keep on raising it though, let's say to 250,000, we run out of memory and a memory error is raised. What's happening here is we're storing the entire list in memory, even though we technically don't need to have access to each list element at the same time. As we're looping, we only need enough memory to store a single string at once. During our loop, let's say we get to the case where we print out the string with 5 characters. We only actually need enough memory to store a 5 character string. Next iteration, we only need enough memory to store a 6 character string. So on and so forth. The amount of memory the entire list is going to take up is dependent on its size. With 10 strings, it is 184 bytes. With 1,000 strings, it grows to 8.8 thousand bytes. And with 100,000 strings, it is 800,000 bytes. You might be thinking that it seems inefficient to generate all of our values at once when they are processed sequentially. How can we design a solution where we only place in memory what needs to be processed at a given point in time without storing all of our data in memory together? What if as we looped here, we could generate a single value at a time, on the fly, right before we need to process it? Let's take a look at this function. We know that when a function is called, everything runs within its own scope. This data variable is an example of a function scoped variable. Whenever we hit a return statement, the function terminates, all function scoped variables are destroyed, and the resulting value is returned to the caller. If the same function is called again sometime later, the function will get a fresh set of new variables. It turns out there's something we can do that prevents the local variables from being destroyed when we terminate a function. This actually means that we can pause and resume the function halfway through. This is known as a generator. A generator is defined in the exact same way as a regular function, however we need to include a yield statement instead of a return. A yield statement will pass control back to the caller, and the next time the function is called, it will resume where the function left off with all of its variables still intact. Rather than building an entire list and returning it once it has been fully populated, let's go ahead and insert a yield inside of our loop and hand back just a single string at a time. A generator is a type of iterator, so all of the regular Python iteration operations apply to it. Before I use it in our loop, let's go ahead and create an instance of the generator. Because a generator is a type of iterator, you can't call it the same way that you call a regular function. Instead, you must iterate through it for it to be called. Every time we perform a single iteration through the function, it is called with its state left fully intact, and we receive whatever value we wanted to hand back with the yield statement, similar to our return. If we create an instance of the generator and step through it with the next function, it will execute until we hit a yield and return the value to the caller. The generator now is essentially paused mid-loop, and the next time you step through it, it picks up where it left off. If we go ahead and use this as our data in our loop now, we will get the exact same results, however each string is generated right before it is needed. The final results end up being indistinguishable. The generator ends up using just a residual amount of memory, as the code is not actually executed until it is being iterated over. If we increase the size of n, the amount of memory being used does not change. As we run through our actual loop now, we will still be using memory, but it will be just as much as we need for each string at a time, rather than for all of the strings at once. This is where the power of generators comes from. As a quick digression, it's important to note that the runtimes of the two different approaches will be nearly identical. If we time how long it takes to run the data generation functions, it looks like the generator function is far faster, however this is to be expected as we didn't actually step through it yet. If we time how long it takes to process each piece of data generated by each of the two functions, we can see that the runtimes are nearly identical. 
Something else to note about generators are generator expressions. In a similar way to how we could have written our regular loop as a list comprehension, you can actually write a generator function as a generator expression. A generator expression is going to function in the same way as a list comprehension, however rather than having the logic within a set of square brackets, we're going to place it inside a set of regular brackets. We now no longer need a yield statement, and this entire expression becomes a generator object. Not only do generators reduce memory usage and make it possible to compute across large datasets, but they provide us with a multitude of other use cases. For example, they enable us to iterate through infinite sequences or real-time data due to being lazily evaluated. The generator can essentially sit and wait for additional data to be available before yielding the next block of data to the caller. To finish off, let's go ahead and do the same thing but with a real-world example. Within finance, rolling returns is a common analysis that can be performed on stock market returns. It works by selecting a roll window and applying this roll window to each consecutive period of returns across the sample. The roll window needs to have the same granularity as the return series itself, so if we have monthly returns, we need to pick a roll window that is some number of months. In this case, let's use a 36-month window. We use the roll window to select the respective range of returns and then apply some operation to them. In this case, we're just going to calculate the annualized return for each window. This means that we would select months 1 through 36 and then calculate its annualized return. We then slide the window to months 2 through 37 and then calculate its annualized return. Then we move on to months 3 through 38. This continues until we have months n minus the window size to n. Rolling returns lends itself perfectly to generators as we have a lot of overlapping data and we only need to process a single rolling period at a time. Let's go ahead and implement this in code. Let's define a rolling rets list that will hold our final results. Let's then loop through each window within a list of periods and then append the annualized return of each period to the final results. We can clean this up by implementing this as a list comprehension instead though. To create a list of periods traditionally, let's first create all of our windows. Each window will start at a starting point and span the length of the roll window. Each starting point will be a number starting from 0 and ending at the sample size minus the roll window plus an offset of 1. We are then going to return each period's returns, which will be the original sample split on each window accordingly. This then gives us a list of 36 month periods. The size of the list is almost 3000 bytes, however this is based off the size of the return series. To turn this into a generator now, we can simply switch our list comprehensions to generator expressions with little change to the structure of the code. Not only can we dynamically generate our periods, but we can also generate our windows as well, since we only process a single window at each time step as well. If we step through the generator, we can see each subsequent 36 month return period. The size of the generator is now only a residual 200 bytes. Of course, it wouldn't be a rolling return analysis if we didn't plot our results at the end. Hopefully you now have a little more understanding behind the power of generators and can implement them yourself in the appropriate cases. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. I have a variety of topics that I want to dive into on this channel, both in the form of informational videos and full-length guides. If there's anything in specific you want to see a video on, feel free to let me know. Thanks for watching.